not everybody is set up to like drill and practice. Like we're lucky enough to like, I just move my carpet and put a mat down. So nice. now my whole living room is set up like how it should be. <laughs> that's right. If you weren't a responsible adult with kids and everything else, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. So, well, awesome. so well, I'm, yeah, happy to go over. I had a couple of things I thought I'd uh, show, uh, and then happy to answer any questions or whatever. Yeah, awesome to uh, if I can help anyone out with some knowledge. But yeah, good to touch base. I'm honored to have so many people touching base with your team and I, I got to do this for my team back home. You know, my gym's been shut down just a little bit longer than yours. So uh, I'll have to do this for my crew back home too. Yeah. If you can, man, and if you need any ideas, uh, you know, I know you probably know, you've probably heard of YouTube. It's on, you just type in YouTube. <laughs> I have it. That's my business partner's domain. <laughs> <laughs> but I have, I have like stuff where I teach my kids program and stuff like that on my YouTube too. So I do it through this zoom the same way. And then I've uploaded a couple that can't make it at that time or want to like see it another time or something like that. But like you, you know, it's just sharing with everybody. I don't care who sees it, who wants it. Yeah. It's for everybody. You know, That's the point, and, right? Jiu Jitsu, Jiu Jitsu is for yeah, everybody. Same, same. So I think it's a good idea, if, you know, it's, it's obviously not the same as having class, but it's as good as it can get, you know, uh, when we're stuck in this kind of situation, at least you're seeing your people, giving them some sort of sense of normalcy, the kids, especially, you know, so yeah. hopefully get a chance I, to I think that. it's great, you know, like I think the biggest thing, you know, sure, getting choked and choking people is something I miss, but just, you know, when you're used to being around 50 people that you enjoy being around every single day and that's called like going to work in my case or going to jujitsu in everyone else's case you know when that gets taken away from you you're like oh wow you know you realize just how much jujitsu gives it's not just about fitness or cardio or like fun you know it's uh you forget just that community you know so it's great to see a community coming together here yeah absolutely i i agree i, I and, and throughout the world right like now we're yeah. we this chance to like have this sort of sense, you know, sense of being so that we can all see each other from everywhere. It doesn't have to be just in your local little town or something like that. You know? Yeah. I think this is great. I think this is great. Everyone looks like news reporters, like everyone's business up here. I just want to know how many people aren't wearing pants right now that they just can't see. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I love how a whole bunch of you just like randomly had to show your like crotch area, but thank goodness everyone had pants on. I didn't know what I was getting myself into asking that. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my, my wife still works as a PA. So she and I both worked emergency medicine for a long time. She still works uh, seeing patients clinically, like through a program kind of like this. And wow. so she's done that, like where she's like lab coat and everything up top and like sweatpants and sleepy ready for the bottom, you know? Like <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Shall we get started? Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. Um, guys, who you can see here, I've just uh, hijacked someone else's home here, but I have Jackie here. Um, you may have seen her in a couple of uh, videos, but we're going to have a look today at uh, something that you guys know that uh, I like to teach, um, Kezigatami. Uh, there's that video on YouTube that was put up. Um, to be honest, it was just probably because uh, it had a good title, you know, Kezigatami Kill System, but people really like that video and i just wanted to just talk a little bit about that this is one of the easiest techniques to actually practice not on a human being in fact i actually tell students to practice this not on a human being because it's kind of harsh on the body and chest right so i'll just uh i could do this with a pillow i could do this with a big teddy bear but i will use uh jackie and uh, i'll just show you guys what i mean so hopefully this laptop here doesn't fall over but <laughs> Fantastic. All right. So if Jackie's lying down here, what you guys often find is when you get past the guard, you're not really inside control yet. So as I'm trying to pass the guard here on Jackie, what's she going to do? Realistically, she's going to start stopping me. So a lot of the time she might stop my chest, my shoulder, my neck, my arm, doesn't really matter, but she's going to try to stop so I can't get past her guard. So even if I'm past the knee, before I get to side control, you can really expect your partner to be facing you with stiff arms. We've all felt this. Fortunately, because I've got gravity, a lot of the time I get past these grips, but not always. So whenever I'm getting these blocking grips, I'm just gonna turn my body. 
okay guys? By turning our body, obviously, we can get past these blocks. So when she's blocking me, gi or no gi, I turn my body, and now I'm gonna take my hip towards her armpit, like this, okay? So this is the position we're trying to get to. This is no different to if I was in side control and she was pushing me from here, I would turn and I'm trying to lift her arm up and get under into her armpit. So this is just a switch by side control position. What her counter to here is, is now to get an underhook on me. So as she gets an underhook, that lets me collect the head and do the full Kezagatami position. So again, before we look at what we can do from Kezagatami guys, I think it's just cool to know why. Why do you use Kezagatami? Because I'm trying to pass her guard, but she's got stiff arms in. Now, if I was wrestling her and I'm twice her weight, this would be okay. I could get through this. But what if she's doing it to me? Let's switch it up. So if I'm down here on the ground and she's passing me, and if I can bench press 400 pounds and she weighs 100 pounds, what do you think is going to happen? She's not going to beat those arms. But if she twists her body, she can go with it and slide right up into my armpit. Now, from here, this is a great position. But if I get an underhook, she can grab the head. Okay? Now, I don't have to get an underhook for her to grab the head. She could just grab this position. So we could be in side control, and she just turns, lifts up the elbow, grabs the head. So to do the check on this position, we'll just move a little bit. She's got me in the headlock control. So guys, we want to make sure her leg is in line with our spine. That means when I go to roll her over, she can push into the mat and stop. She also wants to make sure her butt's off the ground. So she pushes up off the other foot and she puts her weight through me and even 100 pounds feels heavy. She keeps her head nice and low because I don't want to be able to push it and get it with my leg. Okay, so now we start to have a look at our submission options from here, guys. So I'm just going to kind of run through briefly like the story of Kezagatami, guys. Some of you at home, it may be hard to practice this as I go along. However, uh, I'd rather give you the whole story and then we can look at some Q&A on it and then get more general in our Q&A. The first thing from this position is, guys, cook the fight. What do I mean by that? Make them pay. Make sure she pushes off, gets her butt off the ground. So I'm carrying her 100 pounds through my chest at all times, okay? So now we're gonna get mean. The first thing we're gonna to do to get mean, guys, is punish anyone whose hand floats. Anyone whose hand is floating anywhere, anything like this, she's gonna grab it. But notice, she's now gonna crunch her nose down. And that's how she pushes it down. She's not gonna push with her arm. This is not a good battle. Sure, it's my rotator cuff, and sure, that's a dumbbell bench press, but it's still not enough against a strong guy. So she crunches down, and now she puts that wrist under her calf. From this position here, she can now gable grip around my head and pull my head up, and that's normally enough to get a tap. However, if it wasn't, she would then bridge her hips, although being very slow on that bridge. So looking again, once she's got me in the Kezagatami position, if my hand is floating around, she will push it down. She hooks it under her calf and now pulls my head up and slowly bridges, okay? You can choose to triangle your legs if you wish. A little bit more control, not quite as much bridging power. It's totally up to you. But after a while, your partners aren't gonna enjoy that. So as you push down, they'll straighten their arm. That's okay. Our left leg comes over. And now we make sure both knees are facing me. So she clamps her knee in like this, but stay on the wrist, Jackie. And now she's got me here in this arm attack. So she can do the same exact movement. She pulls my head up and now bridges her hips, okay? And now we have a straight arm bar effect. So you're either keeping the straight arm bar or the bent arm. If they don't want to have a straight arm attack, we'll hit them with the bent arm. If they don't want to have a bent arm attack, we hit them with the straight arm, okay? So these are just really great to play around with, guys. But eventually, people are going to get savvy. And when they get savvy, they're going to know they need to tuck this hand away. So they can tuck it away in two areas that are quite efficient. The first one is when they push into the head. When that happens, you have to understand that people can be strong. And if you're not careful, they push, they get the leg up, they cut you down, 
they get on top. You guys have all seen that before? I'm sure it's happened to you. So what Jackie's gonna do is she's gonna push my elbow across and she's gonna get her ear onto my tricep. Once her head is now touching my head, she's gonna lift my head up just like we did before. So she's gonna lift it up. And now her hands go for a big circular motion and she gets a very, very, very tight Katagatami choke. So let's just have a look at that one again because this is gonna happen, guys. You put a good guy or girl into this position, they're gonna to start to make frames. When they make frames, you gotta act quick. That involves pushing the elbow and getting your ear onto the tricep. Now her head touches mine. She lifts my head up and now her hands go out and around. And then it's a very tight tap, guys. Okay? We try to get the choke with the blood. We try to get a complete asphyxiation. We try to get the trachea like, uh, like impacted here so we can get a choke to the air, to the blood. We smother, we put weight through the chest to try to stop the lungs inflating. We're really trying to be as mean as we can. So eventually, what do you think I'm gonna do with this arm? Let's have a look at what's happened so far. I leave it floating. She pushes it down, she hooks her leg over it, and she finishes the attack. All right, but now I go down, I straighten. She's got the straight arm attack here, okay? But now I say, screw that. I want to push her. Yeah, she's got this attack. So the only thing I can do with my arm now is to tuck it under and hold around her waist. You guys, this is the most common thing because now from here, I can run my feet in, I lift and I can roll her over, okay? So when someone does this to you, you have to have a secret hat. And I've known this secret hat for years. I love it. I use it. Just be careful. She's going to go belly down and get her wristwatch under my elbow. And now she's going to get her hands together. And now she switches her hips back and lifts up and gets me in that kimura. So from a different angle here, as I've got Jackie and her arm is around me, guys, especially if you're a lighter guy or gal, you got to be careful here. Not only can this hurt your floating ribs, but it's also an easy way to get rolled. So I'm going to go belly down. Okay, so I go belly down. That makes it very hard for her to roll me. And then I just dig my left hand, just like I'm digging for a rear naked choke, and it comes under her elbow like this. I get an S grip with my fingers. Okay, so I dig under, S grip, and now I go belly up and I lift the elbow as the wrist goes down, okay? Be careful, it's really tight. It's just a full body strength, like a deadlift power on a Kimura. So very, very, very strong. So these are all things you can do, but you know what, guys? Here's a fact. Sooner or later, you're gonna get rolled over from Keza. You're gonna get rolled from Keza Gatami. And when that happens, you gotta have this secret little trick, okay? It's just a secret little trick. It's not hard at all. But when you get rolled over, you've got to be able to hit the arm attack, the Americana driven by the legs. You've got to hit that same attack from the bottom. This is the cheekiest attack in jiu-jitsu, and I hope you all get to use it. So let's see if this is going to work from here. When she rolls me over from the bottom, roll, 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 roll. When she gets to the top, the last thing she's thinking about is to be on the defense. But look at her arm here. I turn, I get my leg over it, and now I have the exact same attack. Pull the head, press with the hips. Be very careful with this one. So again, when you get rolled over, hold on to the head like you're a white belt beginner, seize the wrist, and get your right calf over the top of the wrist. Okay? Pull the head to you, and oh so slowly bridge. Be very, very careful here, guys. Uh, that was an attack that uh, I learned a few years ago, and it totally revolutionized the way I uh, viewed Kezagatami because uh, I know I'm like 225 pounds now, but I used to be this tall and be like 150 pounds or something. So, like, I would get rolled all the time and then beat up. So, like, I that made me not confident. And then once I learned the counterattack from the bottom when someone rolled me 
it was a bonus. So I'm here to answer any questions you guys have on that Keza stuff. And then also uh, just any general questions too. Um, I hope you were able to uh, see and hear a little bit. I know this isn't quite YouTube quality, but uh, yeah, I'm open to any questions, guys. So that, that was awesome. Uh, we have a guy in Miami that uh, he was on the Fight to Win Pro. He uses awesome. that stuff uh, quite a bit, especially the bottom one. So even if you get him inside control, he'll pretend like he's running away and then reach yeah. back and grab your head and arm and then get that same, that same move. And uh, so he, it's crazy, right? <laughs> and so now I use it. I use it all the time, and I use another one that that he hit in that fight to win pro. Uh, we call it the boss rooting because that was the first time I ever saw it a long time ago. Where he yeah. has the head and arm, and then he reaches around the far oh, leg. Oh yeah, and and the, leg, yeah. And then he, <laughs> yeah. That's so funny that you call it that as well, Tom, because I remember seeing that on old school VHS with Boss Rooting back in the day. And yeah. Um, yeah, that's where I learned it from too, man. That thing's vicious. It works too. Oh, it's, brutal. <laughs> it's brutal. And especially if the person that's doing it to you outweighs you even by a little bit, forget it. Like, if it's man, the most I miserable tell you what, that thing ever. will give you like scoliosis. Like, you walk in and you walk out like that. Like, yeah. I reckon if you had scoliosis and you had that done to you, you could be straightened up perfect. <laughs> Can you, do you mind? Maybe she wants to do it to you uh, so you don't squash her, but. Can you show everybody that particular boss rooting where you're getting the, oh, the yeah. leg as well and it's crushing? Of course we can. Of course we can. I'll do it to her because, uh, you know, here we go. Oh, yeah, I've got to move the screen. Hold on. Here we are. All righty. So the one Tom's talking about, guys, is when you're already being a bit of a mean, mean guy already. You're already putting all your body weight through your partner's thing. And the poor, they're holding on. They're holding on really well. And they'll often come back like this with their legs and they're trying to run in. They're trying to do all this stuff. And what it does is it gives you this like horrific opportunity to go under the leg like this. And then you bring your leg to the leg. Okay. Sorry about the full frontal groin shot here, guys. <laughs> and so basically we've got two of our hamstring tendons here and then we close our knees together. It's so horrible. I don't even literally want to make her tap doing this. <laughs> but it bends your spine horizontally like on this acute angle. It's like an acute crunch and it's just the worst thing ever. Like I'm sure this would give a chiropractor a heart attack. So I've got her here. If her legs move in towards me, it's actually strategically efficient. And if I can go elbow deep and then get to my other knee so I'm here, I can now drop my feet and close my knees together but this compresses her so bad this is so mean <laughs> sorry <laughs> um meant to be nice to your training partners but yeah so guys that's a really cool one that's the one tom was talking about old buzz root and it's a uh, it's an interesting move though i must say tom that uh, I once had a student say to me, Tom, I don't know if this would work at a high level competition. And you know what I said, Tom? I said, I do actually agree with you because I don't know what's it going to do, like break a spine. Like what if someone doesn't want to tap? And, you know, we don't ever say that because in training, I tap quick. Like I'm, I don't, I'm not going to get injured. And so he's like, I don't think anything would happen. So do it to me as hard as you can and, uh, you know, see, see what happens. And um, nothing drastic happened when I did it as hard as I can. He's very flexible, but he actually got this like back problem sort of that stemmed from it that like came later. And uh, I know everyone here, especially you Americans are thinking, oh my God, like worried about me getting sued because I've just got a student and bent them sideways because they said it wouldn't break them. But he was fine, but it did kind of jack him up. Yeah, ribs and everything like that. But it's kind of a pro wrestling move. You know, would I want it done to me by some 250 pound guy? Definitely not. So, so it does work at a pretty high level. Uh, I mean, the fight to win pro, I'm going to send you this link to my buddy. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, fight, if it works at fight to win, I mean, yeah, that's one of the best stage shows ever. I just more mean like as a doctor, Tom, you know, like, uh, oh, yeah. Like what, what is the end game? Like we can say, okay, we can do this and we can get a dislocation of this or, you know, we can get a fracture of the radius bone or we, we can talk about what happens. It's just one of those moves that there's just so much. You're basically getting crushed. You're just yeah. getting crunched. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, they're gonna they're gonna run out of air, and that's like, oh yeah. I have it even drilled on me. That's how I feel. It's just complete. It's like a car sitting on your chest. Yeah, and the jack came out. That's a great way to put it. It's like a car has parked itself on top of you. How's it gonna injure you? Well, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> somehow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have a question. I noticed, and my buddy uh, Rennie, who's who I'm talking about, is the one that did it. You reach through the close leg. I tend to reach for the far leg, so I'm not at all at risk for the crucifix. Do you ever find yourself worrying about the crucifix if their head does come out or anything like that? I know it's if you have a good clamp, it's not a problem, but that's one Definitely. of the questions what that somebody's asking. Said. Yeah, they both have their pros and cons. Like uh, what I find when I grab the close leg, you're more at risk of crucifix. When you grab the far leg, you're more at risk of the back takes. Um, so if there's like a flexible guy, um, Say you imagine like just some flexible competitor. Um, I probably wouldn't go the far leg on, on that person because they're probably going to be flexible enough that, that that torque, like is that bit better angle than this? So like that, and then they'll often take my back, you know, because if they're flexible enough to get that single hook in. But then an old school guy, well, then no, I do it the opposite. I would grab the far leg on him rather than risk the crucifix, which is something that Tom like, I, I'm not trying, like, geez, I'm only 32. I can't be that old school. But, you know, crucifix isn't as popular as it used to be, you know, like uh, because of the IBJJF point system, not many people did crucifix, even though I learned crucifix probably well before I learned back control well. So they're both good, Tom. I agree with you. There's less risk of crucifix on the far leg. Um, yeah, just depends on who I'm doing it to. And it depends on which leg I can get. But to be honest, I haven't done this in high level competition, that move. This is just more something I do to my buddies to be a jerk. <laughs> be uh, I would never be a jerk to my buddies or my students, right, guys? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, they're not only meant to be my friends, they're also paying money for the privilege and they're getting their spines twisted. Jeez, I thought I was a nice guy before this show. Hey, I told you, I told you, we changed everything. We got rid of the word douche move and we just call it patriotic, remember? Patriotic move. Hey, speaking of that, I feel I need to do this. Sorry, I'm not just trying to get nude just to uh, scare <laughs> my viewers. All right, this is a shirt that I was wearing this morning, which I thought was uncanny. You may recognize this, Tom. <laughs> From you. This was last year, last yeah. summer. Awesome. Thanks for repping, man. Thanks for repping. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Usually, Amir, where are you at, Amir? Go ahead and uh, do you have questions, Amir? for him i am here there's a whole bunch of questions uh people are very happy and very thankful thank you professor tom uh they were wondering if they could just see that series one more time please just of a quick course summary. no worries amir let's uh i'll make sure everything is in the screen here all right i'll walk i'll go through and just so you know on that the youtube video i've done of this i've stepped through the whole thing sorry that's why i should say that's why i hurried a little bit because i figured well you guys could always just catch it online as well so if we go through the whole series of Jackie's down, I mean, basically why Keza guys, you have to understand that there is a disadvantage of Keza because if I go straight to Keza and she gets either her head out here, okay, or she gets the close elbow out, this one here, she gets that elbow out, I'm kind of screwed. So uh, what we do is make sure we have that and we have it all here. And we'll just move back a little bit. So then guys, basically you step through the series. I wouldn't have my butt on the ground usually. It would be up, but you know, 225 pounds through a 100 pound woman's chest isn't ideal. So if I can, I'm gonna crunch my body down on this. Notice guys, I'm trying to take my arm out of it. So I keep my elbow close, back, crunch, and then I hook my leg over. Give a nice deep bite here guys. Don't leave it out. Give a nice deep bite here. And now I can either triangle my legs off or leave them untriangled. Either way, I'll close them off. And now I lift her head up and slowly bridge here, okay? She'll eventually start to straighten her arm. And now I need to take my knee and put it over the wrist. And I try to really clamp the wrist, guys. Really clamp the wrist between my hamstring and calf here. So as she straightens, I'll clamp over and I tilt two knees in. This is so important. It sets this fulcrum here. And now I can start to lift and bridge, okay? However, she'll often hold it there, smart, okay? So I go belly down, I go under here, okay? Under with my palm down, 
S grip, kick my base through, and now I lift that elbow up as her wrist goes down. Again, very horrible, <laughs> as Tom put it, Professor Tom. It's just very horrible in a lot of very different ways. But eventually, they'll start to push at the neck. This is very smart, flexible. You know, you do this to a 16-year-old kid, they'll push your head, they get a leg over, it, they'll be on top armbarring you and stuff before you know it. So when they do that, guys, this is how I finish the head and arm choke always. It's kind of more of a catch wrestling style, but I found, especially when I was a lighter athlete, that this way was the way I got my best results because it was the meanest. And I needed that because I didn't have strength. I didn't have weight. I needed to have a few mean tricks. So I push and I go head to head. Now, I'm not going to take my butt off the ground, guys, because I don't want to hurt her, but I would lift her head all the way up. And now this is the really important thing, guys. My hands go out. They don't just go this way. They go out, which seems counterintuitive. They go out and then around. And if I have all my weight, you'll go to sleep real quick. So that's the series. Oh, technically, we could get rolled over as well. So if we got rolled over, we'd just be doing that same Americana from the bottom as well. So... That's a really good one. But yeah, I've got those steps through on my YouTube channel too. So you guys can check them all out for free, obviously. Um, but yeah, I'm down. Any questions you guys have, I, I'm here to answer them. Um, that, sorry, that, that, the, the reason you're, uh, can you clarify the reason you're sticking that arm? Are you trying to get the bicep on the far side carotid? Is that what you're looking for? Is that why you're doing it that way? Yeah, but basically trying to do a few things there, Tom, but... Um, one of the biggest things about stretching that out is, yeah, trying to get that bicep into that carotid, like, efficiently. Um, I think, like, 90% of the choke occurs there. Uh, for me, I, I think the shoulder is the accessory in this case. Um, so, what I'm trying to do... Oh, let's see if this... So, like, as I've got my hand around, I'm going to make sure my hand is, like, pronated. So, can you see my arm here? So, I can't see the screen now, but... Um, Basically, I want to pronate my hand. Like, I don't want to have my bicep flexed and miss because sometimes the neck will be here. So I want to put that down and straighten it out. So I've got this, like, long, flat bicep that I put in now. So now when I come around, that's going to, like, drive through their neck. So kind of a lot of it is driven from me, Tom, looking at, like, the mechanics of the bicep. Like, putting that flat, straight, long head of that bicep in and then pulling through to try to like get it into the neck. You know what I mean? Almost like use the bicep as the choking device. Um, and yeah, just stirring the pot. So out and around, just trying to like, I try to tell students, keep your head down, put all your weight through their chest. Cause the compression factor of this choke taps most people, most people like even in competition, a lot of my students just tap them out on the way to finish like this. Um, just pressure, mean, uncomfortable, and, uh, you know, just trying to make it hell from, you know, like, all the way around and being willing to re-stir the pot. So if you hold that for 10 seconds and they don't tap, I'll just do it again. And if I've got my body weight on you, it just eventually, you know, you're just going to run out of gas and the choke will get tighter, tighter. But I find Tom, like I finished the, like I can finish the Karagatami head and arm chokes all the different ways. I really like them. I've got more arms. But uh, for me, that catch wrestling style is just the first one that I like hated, like myself. Like when someone did it to me, it, was, it wasn't just a tap. It was like an unpleasant, you know, experience. It's like even if I got attacked by a bear and survived, it would have been an unpleasant experience. That's what it was like when I got choked like this. So that's why it made me love it, you know. That's awesome. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Cooch is asking if you have any tricks or tips to prevent the head from slipping out your opponent's Oh head man, head. yeah, definitely. That's a great, like what Amir is saying guys is 110 percent like the head slipping out. So the first thing that I realized is the head is secondary to the arm. So let's, uh, uh, there you go, let's have a look. So uh, one of the things that I do is, so what Amir was talking about guys is when the head slips out. So if her head slips out, whoop, She's basically on my back, okay? So to stop the head slipping out, um, I, do a, I like to do a couple of things. Uh, the first one is ensure we, we put a bend on that head. You know, I don't, I don't want the head flat. I, I want her 
head to be to be lifted so as i'm here like this i'm always lifting her head so like I'm not just relying on the head being stuck. I'm directly like lifting it up into my torso, like squeezing it, if you will. Uh, that, that's one thing that I like to use. Uh, the other thing about the head is if she's trying to get the head out and I lose it, I'm not actually that worried if I focus on the arm that I have. So kind of like viewing the glass as half full, if you put all of your attention on the arm, the head doesn't go anywhere. So this is something that I had to learn, I think probably as a brown belt, a couple of times someone got their head out and I'm like, oh no, like they're on my back. They're winning the fight. And that's a steep price to go from I'm winning to you're on my back is like going from a billionaire to homeless. You know, it's a big jump. So one thing that I do is when they do get their head out, right, I just hold on to the arm as tight as I can. And it's like, Ugh. Like, uh, give it here. Like, hold on to the elbow. Like, I'm directly holding as tight as I can. And I put my bicep right on her tricep here so her elbow can't slip out. So it's like I'm holding her elbow like a head. And then she'll be trying to get my back and stuff like this. And then I just reach back, grab the head, and adjust the leg. So if we play that out, she gets the head out. I hold on to the elbow like crazy. And now I reach back. And now I reach the leg to my hand. So. If that answers your question, Amir, on how I look at retaining the head, that's definitely like, I like to always keep it positively held, like not just assume it will be stuck, but then it will get out. Like, well, I like to, I don't always like to control in jujitsu. I like to let the mouse run a lot because I think that's the fun of it. You know, in a street fight, obviously that wouldn't be ideal, but in jujitsu it is. I think it's fun, but I will focus on the arm. In fact, a lot of the time to like, I guess further answer that question, Amir, one of my number one ways of getting the head, because a lot of people that train with me know that if I get that, it's going to be a rough day. Like if anyone gets Kezigatami on me, it's a rough day. Like I would never let you start there. So a lot of people block the head. And so it's hard to get the head. And if you have just an arm, it's okay. Just a head, it's not really okay. So a lot of the time, that's actually how I get headlock control. So sometimes like to further illustrate this, uh, Amir, if I've got Jackie here, Say if I was passing her guard like this and she's pushing at me that I can't get around her head or I can't get in, I'll actually grab that arm and hold that arm as tight as I can and lay on it like this. And she will try to get my back because I just gave her my back. But if I've got the elbow, I just push into her, wing back and take the keza. So that's actually like a little hack that you can use in jiu-jitsu. It's like this hilarious bait where you just lay on their arm and then they grab your back, but they can't get hooks in or anything. And then you just grab the head and walk your leg and you can put them in there. So I really like the Keza because I feel that you can bait a lot of people in there. And once you're in there, it's the worst one for me. Like it's definitely the least. Uh, I let my students all start in dominant positions on me when I train every day. And I never let, they're not allowed to start in Keza Gatami. They're just not allowed. It's too rough. It's too good. You know, I, 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 I agree. I agree 100%. I hate that. That's probably my least favorite position probably ever to be on bottom of, especially if they're bigger. Um, two things. Oh, I, yeah. wish Ryan, I wish we had uh, my, our student, Ryan Reeser. He, uh, he was on the 08 Olympic team for judo and he's oftentimes on here, but he does that single arm that you were just showing uh, yeah. like a grappling dummy where he'll just yeah. take this arm and hold it. And then he yeah. attacks that arm. He'll get people to tap just from like, you know, weird Kimuras or weird, like wrist on the back, just proximal to that elbow, and yep. like straight arm lock people. From yeah, the just the old straight arm. Yeah, yeah. So he'll hit people with that with that move, just like that, and just give up position. And I'm like, ah, man. Well, nice the one thing, I, and you know, if you can combine that with that head grab, you know, then you can yeah get the opportunistic straight arm lock or something like that. But then you also can get that head and keep the position. And I think that's all ultimately when jiu-jitsu becomes awesome is when you can take risks and do things that are uncanny, but you're not really left to pay the ultimate price, you know? Like, so like, I love taking risks, you know? I love all that stuff on the mats, off the mats. But obviously, we try to take sensible risks. So that's why when I tell students, yeah, jump on the arm, but do try to get the head if you can. But then again, you know, you've got these Olympic judo squad and everything, guys, I mean, they're going to have some pressure and they're going to be cranking that arm pretty well. <laughs> yeah. And, and can you, uh, the, the leg grip, do you, if you have pants, do you grab the pants, do you always grab 
the, the far meat of the hamstring and pull it in, or do you have a particular grip? I know you're being nice like, to her, but yes. So I'll I'll show you. Like this is an odd angle, but uh, I I like cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I'd be doing this. Don't let my mom say this. I actually grab uh, this, the hamstring tendon there. So like, I actually like just grab a hold of it directly. Like I find most people, when you learn to flex your hamstring and you can grab it, like I actually just physically grab that tendon. Like, so I'm not pulling it at Tom. It's just like a hook, like an open grip. So I, if I rotate here, like there, I'm grabbing onto that thing, like right there. Like that's like a, so like, I guess I'm like a bit lanky or whatever, but most of my students do that too. But most of my grips, Tom, I do do no gi grips, even in the gi. Um, I love playing around with the gi. I love lapel wrapping and stuff. But most of my combative stuff, I do mostly no gi grips. Uh, yeah, I grip gis for fun. That's awesome. That's an yeah, awesome. It works too. Like that's great. Especially if you're not like, if they're really big, some of the smaller students will need to grab their geese. Like when you do a dance on someone twice your size, sometimes you just can't reach here. You've just got to get your gi, you know? So yeah, definitely. I mean, if you can't grab that tendon or some people's just builds, like I'm like a lanky guy, but if you are like a real strong guy, um, you know, or something like that, you might not have that tendon like that. You might have some big bulging muscle there or something. So like not everyone can probably grab it as easy as me. That's a great recovery. Thank you, Professor Tom. And Professor Tom Lin, if, I, uh, if I'm bugging him too much, just let me know because we have a lot of questions here for him. Speaking oh, of- Oh, do you? Am I not seeing these? I can see this little thing flashing on my screen. Is this this chat? Are these people asking questions? Am I meant they're, to be reading this, Amir? They're, no, they're, they're privately sending it over to me. Oh, and you, okay. just mentioned, <laughs> you just mentioned hacks uh, for, or darses. And uh, Shane is asking if you have any tips tricks or hacks for people with short arms for the oh, Darce yeah. choke? So I was really short. Like I should say this, like I'm six foot four now. Um, but uh, I mean, we were all really short once unless you came out of the womb ginormous. But um, I was like in grade 12 of school out of uh, 200 kids, I was the shortest, you know? So like a, I was like a really short kid. I only grew in 12th grade. So um, all my jujitsu I learned as like a short kind of like, skinny pudgy kid um so i always had short arms and couldn't and i trained with adults so i could never reach the short arm das is like a really good one where you grab the cloth if you're in no gi uh like this but people who have shorter arms can also play around with like japanese neckties and a few of the other ones that don't require the figure four lock much like if you're a stockier student at my academy rather than teaching you a traditional triangle like this I would teach you a triangle like this just because it's more conducive to your uh, build. But mostly I think for the DAS, if you do have shorter arms is understand that feeding your hands through like this, and then you can go to DAS this side for the record manic onto this side, or if you've got short arms, a chin strap guillotine. I don't have short arms. I have ginormous freaking arms and, uh, I love the chin strap guillotine, even though I can normally lock a dart. When I grab a guillotine, that's normally a big enough space to put someone's head and arm in. I still like to go for the guillotine a lot. So I think if you're shorter, the guillotine is better because you've got less space to take up to choke. So I think, uh, you know, jujitsu is equal to everybody. The short guy, girl, old, young, flexible, strong. It's, it's treats everyone equally. So in the dart, Definitely go for it, but you're probably going to have like a better Japanese necktie and a short arm dance. I hope that answers. You you said you said no gi. Uh, you, I, I, I imagine you meant gi with grabbing that uh, forearm grip. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and, and in no gi, uh, I would more be playing like more of a Japanese necktie type game or something like that. You know, like because. Uh, you can do the short arm dance variations, but I, I don't really like, I think without the gi, there's not much benefit to them. You know, like it's like, if you do the short arm variations, I find uh, no gi, well, at least for me, like fingers slip off, like even a fully locked dance, sometimes fingers slip off. Um, so, you know, personally, I only do the short arm version in the gi and in no gi, I would teach the short arm version more as like a, yeah, just, Go for like a chin strap guillotine, like a head and arm guillotine, I think is one of the best chokes. That's probably like my number one choke submission that I do to people, head and arm uh, guillotine. 
That's awesome. Thank you. I want to jump back to uh, your grip on the Kaskatami. Is there a reason uh, they're asking that you go with the S grip or is it personal preference? For the S grip, for the, uh, when I do the choke or like the- uh, when, when, they have, when they wrap their arm around your body. Oh, oh you, the Kimura you one. To grab that arm and the S grip rather than gable grip. Oh, sure. No worries. Uh, purely reach. I can do gable and stuff like that. I mean, I could do like sort of like a wrist butterfly. Um, but basically, because uh, in that case, you've got to go around their arm and their head. So now we've got this longer like loop because um, it's the elbow. It's not even like a triangle. It, it's like all the way to the elbow. I often find that like if I do it like this, I could get away with that. But if it's a guy my size, maybe I'm back at a gable. But now if it's anyone bigger than your size, this is what we have to do. Like there's not, you can't reach, there's nothing left. So more of by necessity, anytime my grip can come in, I'm going to try to make it like this. As I go out, we now go through our different grips. We're slowly slipping, like slip to this grip, slip, you know, slip, slip, slip to this. This is like the last one, you know, there's nothing. I don't know, unless Tom knows some secret grips from olympic taekwondo days that are, i don't know i don't know anything past that so that's normally the case it's normally the the bigger guy they're like pushing their chest out and you're running out of strength and space and that's the only one you can get so are these grips better yes not realistic there awesome awesome you're getting a lot of head nods and thumbs up from matthew and <laughs> that's good Next, we have a question from Nacho that I'm not quite understanding, so he's going to unmute himself and uh, fire away. Hey, Professor. Um, hey, what's up? Not much. Good seeing you. So you, when you guys were demoing it, she, was, she had a really tight Kesakatami up on you, sitting up, hips up on you, and you just looked like you crawled in and leveraged, pointed her, and rolled her over. And I know we've drilled this before, but I always forget this move, and we have a couple guys in here one of them, you know, Mr. King there that gets Kaskatami quite a bit. He and does it. What a jerk. He's out. a big guy too. <laughs> but can you, it was very fluid and fast how you did it. Can you show that real quick? Because she was sitting and, and I get it. I understand it. But when you have heavier guys, not saying King's heavy, but he's heavy. But you have heavier guys. Is there an easier leverage way? Do you weight it out? Because if you're in that position, it's pretty awkward and, and sucks right to begin with. So is there a way to get there quicker? I mean, qualitatively, I would just say that, yes, you're doing a fine line because if you wait for the right time to escape, <laughs> you've tapped anyway, you know, 10 seconds later, that's like, I mean, that should be the torture, you know, like if you just took someone you need tortured, like some terrorist and just put them in Kezigatami, like I swear you could turn anyone in about 20 seconds. But of course, when you are getting tortured under there, you know, you start making bad decisions. And so like, you got to not rush to escape and ruin your one chance and then just get gassed and die, you know, but you can't just uh, also wait for the right time and just get gassed anyway. So the biggest thing I tell people is you have to have um, two escapes. So whenever you escape something, you shouldn't, it should never work. Everybody on here, just know, especially if it's any white belts, Escape should never work. They should never work. We're teaching this art where we put people in Keza. If it was easy to escape, then, you know, <laughs> jujitsu wouldn't be effective. You know what I mean? So uh, it's important to realize it's hard to escape. But what we can do is by going for A and B, we force our controlling partner into bad decisions. So to escape in jujitsu, you need a trick. Okay. So that's, that's my opinion. So uh, my tricks are always the same. We have two escapes that are the opposite of each other and we go one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And eventually you get out of almost anything. So in this case, the roll was the one and I'll show you the tips that I would say for that, Nacho, but then I'll also show you the secondary escape that leads to an easy roll because rolling someone bigger than you is harder. So if she's got me here in Kezigatami, right? So she's here like this, right? And she's got me in this Kazugatami position. I want this grip around her to be digging into her floating rib so that I'm holding her so tight that when I move my body, so too does her body move. So I'm not just going to hold. I'm going to put my palm down so the styloid head and my radius bone dig in, like these bones here dig in to her floating ribs. 
I now gable grip, clamp my elbows, and I'm gonna run my hip in till it's under her hip. Once my hip is under her hip, I can bridge and then roll her over, okay? However, if we just shuffle a bit here, the problem with that is if she puts her weight over that side over there, ah, it's gonna bust my ribs up. So what I wanna do is give her a reason to lean on me, give her a reason to be pulling at my arm, which will eventually let me roll her. And I do that by turning towards her, the opposite of the roll, and pulling my elbow out. Now, if that elbow comes out, we can get her back, but she won't let it come out, especially not the first time. So she's gonna grab it and she's gonna put all her weight up onto me, and that's what gives me the roll. Now, if Jackie doesn't get rolled and she leans over there, then I can pull my elbow out. But now she pulls it back and puts all her weight on me, and that's what gives me the roll, okay? So they're just some of the tips that I use but the biggest thing that makes a difference when someone's really big is that concept of digging that radius bone here. And especially if you can get that styloid head like right in and then crank that thing in, like they come with you. Much like, uh, let's just say if my 30 pound, you know, son came out here and started trying to push me around, um, he wouldn't be able to physically move me. But if he came out here with like a razor sharp nail, and started poking that into it. Whoa, he could move my whole body wherever he would need me to go. So that's what I'm trying to do with that bone there in the ribs. And then the second thing I would just say is uh, when you've got them and you're going for the roll, you can never just roll them over you. If they're bigger than you, that's going to hurt your midsection a lot. I like to get my hips under, bridge them directly forwards. So then their weight is up. Because uh, once their weight is up, they are light. So I want to bridge them up onto their shoulders above me, then roll them. I never want to use torque across my ribs when there's already like 200 pounds of weight on my ribs. That's how you get injured. That's how you like tear ribs and, you know, intracostals and serratus. And like, that's how you have injuries. So they're like my little tips. But uh, it's not easy to get out of there. It sucks. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. It's more like 250 pounds, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting I'm getting a lot of uh, hate mail from uh, King. He feels like we're conspiring against him to find the King Slayer move. So we're yeah. going to let one of his questions through. He's asking if you have any techniques from the Katsukatami to set up a footlock. Yeah, absolutely. So like uh, there was a big part of me that wanted to do this uh, before. Um, you know, uh, when you to me, the reason I'd go to the feet from Keza is because I need to bail on upper body. So there are two reasons why I'd do that. And I'm going to show you both. Uh, these aren't, for the record, to me, these aren't tricky attacks. These aren't attacks that you should do just because it's fun to add in. These are like necessary. So um, yeah, I will show them because these are like answers to real problems. But I like to attack the legs. So I'm a bit biased. So if she's lying down here, and I have her in Keza, one of the times where you really need to, just move back this way a little bit, one of the times where we really need to attack the legs is if she brings her far leg over and in like this. So Tom, uh, you know, Professor Tom was just talking about how we can start to grab these and bring out, you know, legs together. And that's a definite option. But sometimes when I grab here like this, I've got to be careful because she's going to start coming out to my back. So when she lets go of my body, this is bad. She's going to get her arm out. She gets to my back, but it also breeds an opportunity with this leg in here. And when she lets me go, it lets me spin for this leg. So the number one thing that I do when I'm spinning for this leg is making sure that I can attack her and she can't attack me. So the first thing I need to do is get my upper body away. So the only reason I'm attacking the legs is because I have to bring my upper body away from her. So anytime she's here, as soon as she's undone her grip to get to the top, I'm going to move my upper body away from her. She can't get my back if she can't see my back. But now with this leg that's over me, I'm going to get my knee to the inside. I'm going to leave my foot where it is. So I get my knee to the inside, and now I'm just stepping over for a deep okay, cut, which will then lead me to my, my outside heel hook. Or, of course, I could start to apply all of my other foot locks as well. So just to demonstrate that once, if I'm here, she gets her foot in, she's coming up, she undoes her leg. I've got to get away from her upper body. 
and now watch this knee come on the inside okay and we're straight over here now and so for me i'd be rowing on the toes pulling the heel up and now finishing with my outside heel hook from this position i would expect she would roll with it so as she starts to roll go for it roll roll with it 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 here i would be looking at transferring to an inside ashi with a reverse heel hook to follow the roll so again from this position i'm here like this she would roll I would bring this over, and now I'm here in my reverse uh, heel hook with my inside ashi locked off on her blind side, ready to bridge. To me, that is like a disaster scenario, and um, that disaster scenario leads into like my best attack, which for me is uh, I like the reverse heel hook from uh, trying with off inside ashi where I get to bridge, and they're not facing me. That's like my favorite. So yeah, there are footlock attacks. There's more too, but that combines the two principles I like to teach private students on it, which is when it's going wrong, you're gonna either hate Keza or love it. And most people, if you've been doing Keza to them and they're nearly getting out, the last thing they're thinking of is being heel hooked. So you could do a straight footlock as well. I should say you can do a straight footlock. Anytime you guys can do a heel hook, you can do a straight footlock too. Awesome, well, King has a big permagrin on his face. I'm worried about his partner's uh, ankles here soon. But uh, <laughs> we're going to go over to uh, Jacqueline. Professor Tom Lynn, do we have time for one more question? Okay. Uh, Jacqueline's question is, do you have any advice for somebody with long legs that has a friendly guard? There's too much space oh. in her guard because of the length of her legs. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty common, especially with people who are long-legged too, like, if you have someone like with long limbs, like I'm one of these people, so I'm like talking, you know, a bit of nonsense or a bit of trash on them, but that's me. So I'm allowed to say it. Uh, a lot of the time we're like, you know, flexible and we're a bit like, I don't want to say lazy, but you know, that's just the style. It's the style. You don't get stocky muscular guys acting like that on the mats. Like it's, it's, it's often like, it's not like it's causatory, but it's certainly corollary. Um, uh, what I would say is get very good with your clothes guard and having a tight clothes guard um, and just clamping. It's all about clamping. You need to be using your long legs. And because they're long, you have to triangle them off or cross your feet to get structure and just keeping it tight and keep their posture down. Everything, if you've got long legs in clothes guard, is about bringing the posture down. I mean, that's everybody. Everybody who's a white belt and above should be trying to bring people's posture down. But when you are in the clothes guard, if you've got long legs, basically because you've got long levers if they start pushing at your knees sometimes you've got long levers so what you want to do is i just got to adjust the camera if you do have those long legs is you have to know not to do a thigh master like this this isn't strong okay so if i move jackie out of this equation for a bit here so can we see me here okay so when you've got long legs in clothes guard you this is weak because these like your femurs are these long levers on weak muscle groups. So what you do is you keep your feet crossed and with long legs, you do this, watch, you kick to the roof. Be careful doing this, you will break people's ribs. Uh, Professor Tom will tell you that if you do it, go to a white belt tournament and you do this, you can tap nine out of 10 people like that and you get disqualified. So I don't recommend tapping people out, or at least not a white belt, but I don't recommend tapping people out like that but knowing that logistics with long legs or short legs for that matter, that can't always cross, they, uh, that makes a closed guard very, very, very tough. But if you've got long legs, seriously, just start triangling everybody. Just triangles, 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 reverse triangles, front triangles, rear triangles, side triangles. Triangle, triangle, triangle. Awesome, awesome. Well, Ted's asking for an encore real quick. Um, you Last move, you mentioned that you can, when you were attacking the legs, that you could do a straight ankle lock as well and yeah. not just a heel hook. He's asking if you would mind showing that. Absolutely. So um, anytime, yeah, so with straight ankle locks, guys, uh, the reason we heel hook at a higher level is just because uh, a lot of the time we've been straight ankle locks so much. Like me, my foot's been busted up so much that it can bend so far back and it's not really a catastrophic break at the end of it um whereas a heel hook will just blow your 
knees apart. So just because I go for heel hooks doesn't mean straight ankle locks aren't valid. Against a normal person, I could probably break them just as quick with a straight ankle lock. But um, it's just when we train a lot and get really flexible, like the people competing, competing at black belt at good levels are like, are all the crazy flexible weirdos and strong and fit and fast. And so, but to do the foot lock, you just need to realize a few things. So uh, just make sure you put a sharp fulcrum underneath. I don't want to see any forearms. I don't want to see any of the flat surface here between the uh, radius and ulnar bones. I want to see the styloid head, that lump there at the end of your radius bone. I hope my physiology is correct. I feel guilt. I'm talking in front of doctors here. I, I hope Tom's not going, that's not what it's called. But you want to make sure that that radius bone is cranking in, not, no muscle involved. So once you've got that set like that with a foot lock, you then just need to make sure that the foot can't move. If the foot can move, the foot lock won't work and trying to get a little bit mean with it. So I'm just gonna show you the ankle lock from there, which is a top side IBJJF legal ankle lock. So this is something that guys like Mike, Mikey Musumeci and stuff like that do, it's very effective. So from this position, I'll just lower this down. So when she was here and I got into that position here like this, this is the position we were in. I wanna wrap her foot and I wanna push it out as I do it. So I push it out, and I wrap here. You can't wrap it tight here if it's touching your body. You gotta like push it out and then wrap it. And I wanna bring that bone right to her ankle. It has to be touching. It's not touching, bone on bone is the only thing that works, guys. Here, okay? And now from this position, what I do is I hold my hands up, I clamp my knees, but now watch my elbow and shoulder and head go back this way, okay? Don't try to, you can't actually go here. In IBJJF, I can't turn that way unless she does, because this is high side. So I have to demonstrate to the referees that I'm going this way. So that's why I look this way. And then what that's doing is more of like a toehold to her now. Of course, if she was able to roll that way, this way, then I would just be, here. I would just be finishing my normal ankle lock. Although, if I ever finish a normal ankle lock, something that I've done certainly since black belt is uh, not go from ashigarami here. I'll always go two feet into the ribs, especially in the gi where they can hold onto my gi. Two feet into the ribs, two knees squeezed, and then I'm going to fall onto this side deltoid here, like this, and then bridge. But, yeah, you shouldn't be able to do it all. Like, uh, if you set it all up right, you should... Uh, have no problems getting an easy tap. So that's a straight foot lock. I love straight foot locks. I would probably uh, do on a normal week of rolling like a hundred straight foot locks a week of tapping and rolling with like color belts and up. So I like them. Awesome. Awesome. I'm getting inundated with thumbs up and so many thank yous. Everybody's so grateful. Uh, before I turn it out over to uh, Professor Tom, Professor Buyu. Um, everybody just want to say thank you so much for spending this time with us. Uh, we've learned so much. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It's a, it's a massive honor to be on here with you guys. Thanks so much for spending a little bit of your time to hear from some Australian down here surrounded by uh, birds. I don't know if you can hear the birds in the background here. They're pretty loud. But uh, yeah, just some guy stuck down under. It's been an honor to be able to be on here with all you guys. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Tom. Buyu, do you have any, any questions, anything you'd like to add? I know you kind of sat in the background today, Buyu. That's no, not I just, I just want to say I'm grateful for having Professor Tom in our side. I'm grateful for he's be a 220-pound guy friendly because I don't <laughs> want to get hurt. Oh, goodness. It's great to see you, Professor. I know we got a chance to meet at Masters Worlds last year, and I look forward to I hope that competition might actually still be on because I am dying to get back to America and uh, see everybody. Well, they, they, are, they are ideally, if everything comes well, they might be going to put like a uh, and Worlds together, you know? Ah, yeah, that would be awesome. That would be the amazing. We'll see. That's something that's under the line and not something concrete. But, uh, you know, that's just an idea that uh, gather all the black belts and the old black belts like me 
um, in a in a in a center of a sense of we can all see together, be as a as a good friendly uh, friends that that has only one flag, which is jujitsu. Um, yep. I just want to say thank you, professor. There are great techniques. Um, we're very grateful for have somebody like you here with your caliber. And like I said, you know, I'm, I'm more grateful to have somebody as a friend because I know uh, rolling with the king can be very challenging, but with you can be very dangerous. So I'm grateful for having <laughs> Hey, thanks so much, guys. Look, I love that. Thanks for having me on. And I love what you said, Professor, about, you know, one flag. I mean, uh, we go to jiu-jitsu and we represent ourselves and our clubs and our countries. But especially with this whole uh, pandemic, it makes you just realize, yeah, we're all just humans just doing this incredible art. Just like, yeah, one flag. And uh, it's been an honor to be on here with you guys. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, anybody else have any questions for him before before he goes? I know a lot of you guys are fangirling or fanboying. Paige, James, <laughs> <anybody else? laughs> yeah, all the single ladies, you can follow me on Instagram. <laughs> so you, you got a good eye roll in the background there. <laughs> oh, excellent, excellent. I should be uploading my uh, my Tinder account or something up here. <laughs> <laughs> Links will be in the bio. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I appreciate Tom. I appreciate you coming on, man, spending your time. I know for me, the most valuable thing for me is time. And I know we have a little bit more of it now, a lot of us than we used to, but still how we spend our time is, is very, very important. And so I appreciate you spending your time with us, you know, to man. share this with us, man. It was a wonderful, wonderful morning. I'm really glad I got the chance and look forward to hopefully seeing a whole bunch of you when I'm next stateside. All right. All, All right. right. Well, you always have a place in Colorado, man. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, I cannot wait. It's my favorite state in America, and I've only been there once, so for whatever that means. <laughs> That's it. Awesome. All right, guys. All right, thank thank you so much. Guys. Have an amazing day. Thanks, Coach. Take care. Hey, see you, King. See you, guys.